Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you for leading the worship there, Steph, and thank you, Sean, for your leadership there as well. Let's turn to our Bibles here, to the book of Philippians we'll be in. Book of Philippians, we'll be in chapter 2 today, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we'll be in verses 25 and to 30 today. And the title for today is An Answer to Prayer. That is our, the theme for today, answer to prayer. You're going to see an answer to prayer as we read these pass- this passages uh, today. But I want to begin first with the song that uh, Ava in Brooklyn sang um, is a tremendous uh, song. And if you uh, ever look up the lyrics, I encourage you to do that someday. But Phil Wickman's the one that wrote the song. Uh, he's a tremendous writer. Um, but listen, to, when I, I'm not going to sing it for you, but listen, when all I see is the battle, you see what? My victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain moved. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs belongs to you. And it's a tremendous song that they sang, and it's actually one of my favorites. And if I were to be truthful, this was actually a song that brought a lot of peace to me uh, when it came on the radio one time, whenever I was going through a battle, I guess you could say, or a storm uh, in this life. And uh, you see, a year and a half ago, from today almost, um, Family got ready. The day started off pretty good, actually. Family got ready for church, got dressed, went off. Had a good drive. Nobody was screaming in the car. It was great. Went to church, and then we were blessed that day to be voted in as pastor of the Altoona Bible Church. It was a tremendous uh, privilege and still a tremendous privilege today to serve our, our God here. But during that day, it started off, Liz didn't really feel the best, and we honestly just kind of thought it was just a small little bug, you know, just something to kind of work through. As the day progressed, uh, and even afterwards, uh, she continued to get worse, and so bad that night that we actually had to make a trip to the ER. And what I thought was somewhat minor, something very small, uh, possibly maybe like a, the flu and just needed to get hydrated or, or whatever, just a bug, end up being a life-threatening mystery to the doctors and nurses. Life-threatening. And to make a long story short, the storm hit hard to me, hit really hard to me when I walked into the hospital trying to figure out what's going on, right? The nurse stopped me in the hallway, brings me over to the screens here, and they had screens up there, and it's all the heart rates of all the patients and things. And she said, you see your wife's, that's her screen right there. And I said, yeah. And she said, her heart rate is out of control. It's so high right now, we're not sure what we're going to do. She's not getting any better. We're not sure what we're going to do. And and, and I said, well, we're going to have to transfer her because she's not going to die here. We're not trying, no, 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 we're going to do something, right? The bat, it got real, real quick. The storm hit me so, so hard. Heart rate was so high, and she wasn't getting better. And I only thank God, and we're not going to go through the story, but I only thank God for, in a lot of ways, for the wisdom that he blessed Liz with. She's an RN, registered nurse, and she has some more wisdom than I have. You don't want me to be your doctor or nurse? No, you don't. But thank God for her wisdom, because she just knew the different antibiotics and things, and she just was thinking the whole time and just praying to God to heal her and what's going on. And she just, what about this antibiotic? And she had this conversation with the doctor, and the doctor disagreed with her. And then you know how her nurse says, no, you're going to listen to me, doctor. I know what I'm talking about. This is my life. 
you know. And she stuck up for herself, praise God, for her wisdom. And, and honestly, I praise God because he was able to heal her body. And obviously through modern technology with medicine today helped with that. But with that wisdom. And obviously, uh, everybody here was praying as well in that time. And all of my family members were praying. And people in Wisconsin were praying for her too. We had no idea what was going on. But all I know is that in the blink of my eye, what a day that we thought was going to be a rejoicing day. Hey, we're here now too. And just got blessed to be here at a church. It just got real. It didn't really matter anymore to me where I was. All that mattered was what's going on with Liz. And so either way, God, God healed her. And obviously you guys see her today. She's not here today because no one's sick, by the way. Um, but the idea here is that there, it was an answered prayer. It was an answered prayer because we were praying. And everybody, I thank everybody here who was praying for her at that time. And today, this passage today kind of brought back this memory of mine. It, it brought back this year and a half ago. It, I mean, it's a different case, but we have here an answered prayer. And prayers were going out for this Epaphroditus individual. And, but the idea here is, but before, but before we talk about the reason for the prayers and, and talk about the answered prayer, we're going to talk about who is this Epaphroditus guy first, right? So let's read it here together. Philippians uh, verse 25, uh, yeah, verse, chapter 2, verse 25. It says here, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all, full of heaviness. So he was full of heaviness because that you heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I send him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again ye may rejoice and that I may be less, the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. And before we get going with the prayer, prayer request and, 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 the, and the, obviously the purpose of why he was sick we're going to talk about who, who is this uh, Epaphroditus individual? Who, who is this individual? Well, we know right away in verse 25, he goes, I'm going to send this Epaphroditus individual guy back to you guys. He was Paul's brother in the Lord. He says that, my brother. This Epaph he is my brother. You know, the scripture continually uses the analogy of family when describing our relationship with fellow believers. Do you know that you and I, if you accept Christ as your personal Savior, that you're part of the body of Christ, Christ is the head of the body, right? And God is your Father, and you're a child of God. And if I'm a child of God and you're a child of God, that makes us what? Related somehow, right? Spiritually speaking. That's the best relation you can have for all eternity. You're a child of God. Galatians 3.26 tells us, For ye are all the children of God by what? Faith in Christ Jesus. It's only by faith that you can become a child of God. Believing in what he did for you on that cross. That through his death, burial, and resurrection, you got forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It's by, by faith alone. Nothing that you and I can do. No, mo no money can save you. Nothing at all. God says, here's a gift. You accept it. And so this individual, Paul calls him a brother. We can learn from that because sometimes... We just talk to each other like, hey, you. But you can say, hey, sister, what's up? <laughs> right? That's that seem weird to you? But Paul, you know, Paul is the example for us. Well, you can call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what we are. You're a brother and sister in Christ. To love each other. Just this passion towards him. My brother, he says. God, it, continually, you see through Scripture that there is an analogy of family when describing our relationship with the fellow believers. This individual, Epaphroditus as well, he was a man who helped Paul carry out Paul's mission. Okay? Paul's mission. And again, which was God's mission and calling for Paul. Go to the book of Acts here real quick. To your left. The book of Acts. It's before Romans. Acts verse tw chapter 26. God's mission and calling for Paul. And Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was a part of that 
mission. He helped Paul carry it out. He says, my brother and companion in labor. He was an individual who helped Paul in the ministry. So let's read it together. Acts 26, verse Again, 14, he's given his account from Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. But he says, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me. Acts 26, 14. And saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise. And stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto ye, to thee for this purpose. What is this purpose? To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which, in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes. And to turn them from darkness to light. And, and from the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in who? In me. In the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but rise and stand upon thy feet. Isn't that something that we can learn upon when you get knocked down? Rise and stand upon thy feet. And see, the Epaphroditus helped the Apostle Paul in his ministry. He says here in Philippians 2 that he was a companion in labor. He worked alongside Paul in getting out the message of the gospel of the grace of God. And what I mean he worked alongside the Apostle Paul is that when we read the book of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, they are prison epistles. The Apostle Paul was in house arrest. He's this, he was sitting in his own hired house. Acts 28, 30 says, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. Epaphroditus came in unto who? The Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul can't leave his house. But the gospel of the grace of God is going where? It's going out. It's going further. How's that happening? Because Paul's got faithful individuals helping him out. Friends. Epaphroditus is one of them. He's a companion in labor. And he helped him. He went alongside him. He learned from the Apostle Paul. And he got the message of grace. He's, he's getting the gospel of the grace of God out. Working alongside him. And again, he's allowed going, in, you know, going to and for, you know, leaving Paul and coming back. But again... Paul couldn't go. So again, God's using Epaphroditus here, a tremendous individual. Paul says a companion in labor. He's a brother in the Lord. He's also, Paul describes him as here also, and fellow soldier. Look at that in Philippians 2.25. He's a brother, a companion in labor, and then he defines it even more, a fellow soldier. He became a fellow soldier. And again, the soldier, if, if we're in a spiritual warfare, and this spiritual warfare is faced by all who? All believers. All believers are in this spiritual warfare. Look right across from your chapter 2 to go to chapter 3, and look at this spiritual warfare that he even warns of the, the Philippi church here. He warns these individuals. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. He says, beware of these, beware of the contrary of, of God's word. Individuals that want to distort God's word, rightly divided. Individual, individuals that want to go against the grace of God. He says, beware of these individuals. Satan transforms himself into what? Into the image of light. Does he not? He's working behind pulpits. He's, he's preaching a false gospel. It's going on in Altoona today. The gospel's clear. It's very clear. Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again. You believe in that. You can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It's only by God's grace alone that we can be saved, right? And it's only by faith. And there's individuals that are distorting that. And Paul says, beware of those individuals. But at the same time, it's a spiritual warfare. Satan works in the unbeliever. He's the prince and power of the air that works in all the un. un non-children of God. He works in all of them. 
all the unbelievers, he works in them. And it's a spiritual warfare. Go to Ephesians 6. We already went over Ephesians 6 a couple months ago. But this spiritual warfare is real. And when you understand that it's real, you start walking like it's real. And again, that fellow soldier, is, he was fighting for the gospel to go forth. And one thing Satan does not want to go forth is the gospel. Because it transforms individuals into what? Christ. It gives them a new hope, a new eternity in heaven. Satan wants to take every single individual to hell. Again, Ephesians 6 is real. Look at what he says. He says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the what? The wiles of the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Who do we not fight against? We don't fight against flesh and blood. That's talking about you and I. That's talking about human beings. We fight a spiritual warfare. Again, we just read Acts 26. But he says, rise, Paul, but rise and stand upon thy feet. And he says in verse 18, why? Because the gospel, I want you to give the gospel to open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to what? Light. And from the power of Satan, the deceiver of all... <laughs> Things. He, he's so throwing fiery darts. He's trying to distort the gospel, make it water it down, trying to make you got to work for salvation. God says it's only by faith. It's by grace alone. It's, his, it's by his grace. And it's only by faith that you can believe and have eternal life. There's nothing that you and I can do. He says in, in that when he was in prison there with uh, in the Roman guard came up to him, you know, after the earthquake, right? He was going to kill himself because if not, he was going to get killed anyways because all these, he thought all these prisoners were going to leave. And the guy, you know, he, hear, he hears them singing. And the prisoner, the, the Roman guard says, what should I do? What, what do I have to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what? Thou shalt be saved. It's believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, you and I are fellow soldiers and we are to carry the gospel forth. We are to proclaim we are to preach the gospel. We are ambassadors for Christ. This is not our home. We have a heavenly hope, a heavenly home. And that's our focus, to keep our uh, minds looking up. And so we go back to Philippians here. Philippians 2, he says, he is Epaphroditus here. He's my brother. He's a companion in labor. And he's a fellow soldier. He's fighting alongside me. And when he says fellow soldier... You see in this epistle here in Philippians, in the book of Philippians, I guarantee we, Paul's in prison. He's helping him out, getting the gospel, the grace of God out. I guarantee Epaphroditus, alongside Paul, I guarantee he led many individuals, many individuals, even probably some Roman guards, servants, even cooks in Caesar's household to the Lord. How do I know that? Go to Philippians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 22. When he ends this epistle and he writes off, you know, signs it, he says this, which is interesting to me, which tells me something that the gospel went forth. Philippians 4, verse 22. He says, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of what? Are of, a house, of Caesar's household. Many individuals got saved. Alongside Paul, he led individuals to the Lord. He was in this battle okay he was in the battle again Romans 1 16 I am not ashamed of what of the gospel of Christ it is the power of God unto what salvation he was not ashamed he was fighting alongside Paul Paul says he is a fellow soldier so this individual he's a fellow soldier but interesting he was he was also a man who ministered to Paul's once or needs. Look what verse 25 says. After a fellow soldier, he says, But your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. He was an individual who was, a, who was 
an encourager. He became an encouragement by to Paul's needs. He gave up his own life, his own desires to help the Apostle Paul. You see, you have an individual here, Epaphroditus, who left where all the Philippi saints are at. He's their messenger, left their, his home to go minister to Paul. And he gave them, again, the Philippi church financially supported the Apostle Paul, did he not? And Epaphroditus was the one who hand-delivered that to the Apostle Paul. Philippians 4, verse 18. Go there. He says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Epaphroditus was an individual who didn't think about himself. He thought about others, and he wanted to go meet. I mean, wouldn't you want to go meet the Apostle Paul? But yeah, oh yeah. You will in heaven if you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. But again, he, he, he left his homeland, forgot about his own desires to help the Apostle Paul. He was the man who stepped up and said, that's right, I'm going to take this financial gift, and I'm going to hand deliver it to him. Again, we don't have today's modern technology where you can get on your phone and send money to each other. I'm still not good at that, by the way. I feel weird about that. But we don't have modern technology either where we have cars. They didn't have cars then either. Okay, Guarantee he probably took a boat. Because where was Paul? In Rome. right? So either way, he traveled. He traveled to see the Apostle Paul to deliver this love gift that was sent by the Philippian believers. And again, he became the encouragement Paul needed at this time. He's sitting in prison and he needed some encouragement. Epaphroditus gave him some encouragement. He was a man who cared about advancing the gospel of the grace of God more than his own life. Look what he says here in verse 26, 27. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he had heard that he had been sick. For indeed, he was sick nigh unto what? Death. Uh, to the point of death. Okay, to the point of death. He was, he was about advancing the gospel of the grace of God. Paul, How do you know that, you say? Paul says he's a brother in the Lord, he's a companion in labor, and he's a fellow soldier. He's getting the gospel out to the point where he doesn't even care about his own life. To the point of death. We aren't told how or what caused his sickness, but we see that he was sick Obviously, to the point of death. And even during this sickness, during his sickness, he was more worried about the Philippian saints. He didn't want them to worry about him at all. He, he tells them, he, he longed, Paul tells the Philippian church, the saints, about Epaphroditus, and he longs for you all. He was full of heaviness because that you heard that he was sick. He didn't want them to know that he was sick. Not because he didn't want to know there's business. He didn't want them feeling bad for him either. He didn't want them to worry about him. He was thinking about others. Epaphroditus is a life example of what it is to have the mind of Christ. We have so little knowledge about him, so, so little verses about this individual. But, we, but what we see is a man sold out for Christ and a man wanting to be a blessing to others. He cared for Paul. He cared for the Philippian church, saints. But most importantly, he cared more about getting the gospel to the unreached. It nearly killed him. And guess what? He was a man like the Apostle Paul. Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me to what? Live is Christ, and to die is gain. He had that mindset. He was a man just like Paul. The sickness of Epaphroditus... It was a storm. It was a storm. Paul and the Philippian saints were not weren't expecting it. They weren't expecting it at all. It shattered them. Here's an individual that was there to help the apostle Paul, and he was helping. He was getting the gospel, the grace of God. He's a brother. He's a companion of labor. He's a fellow soldier. And when he got sick, I guarantee you, it shook the apostle Paul. It shook him. He wasn't expecting it. It shattered them. It broke them. 
But just when you think nothing can be done, the one saying I like to say is just let go and give it to God. Pray to the Almighty God. Pray to the Almighty God. That's what we're to do. We're to give it to God. We're to give it to God. Even though you, don't, you do not see the Apostle Paul here stating he prayed or that the Philippian saints were praying, I believe it was a time where Paul was in much prayer for his dear friend. And I also believe that the Philippian saints were also praying for the brother in Christ. Remember, and, uh, yeah, remember, Paul said, first of all, pray for who? All men. First Timothy 1, 2, 1 says, first of all, first of all, stop what you're doing, first of all, and what do you do? You pray. You pray. Galatians 6, 10 talks about, especially of those of what? Household of faith. Ephesians 6, 18 tells us we're to pray for who? All saints. And Philippians 4, 6 to 7 tells you that you're, you're to lay it on the line. Give it all to God. Read that in Philippians 4, 6. You're right there. He says, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. We know from the Apostle Paul that prayer was important. It would have been his and their first response in action. And it should be ours as well in a time of need. We see in many places that prayer is important for all of us. And we are encouraged to pray. We are encouraged to pray. And let me just say this. Don't shortchange God. Do not shortchange God. Because look, verse. Now unto him that is able to do. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we want. Ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. He's able to do it. Do not shortchange God. Give it to God. So when the storm comes, let go and let God. Give it to God and know that God does answer all prayers. It may not be the way you want it, but it's according to His perfect will. And a, and a promising verse to us all, all, all the saints here is we know that all things, all things, not some things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to whose purpose? His purpose. See, God's got a mindset of eternal. He's got an eternal mindset. And if he can use your life or my life to get the gospel out, even to the point of death, Epaphrodites wasn't worried about his death because he was worried about the gospel, the grace of God to go forth. And if an individual got saved through his life, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. That's why Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to what? Die is gain. Epaphroditus had that mindset. We are to have that mindset. God's going to work everything, all things together for good. He's going to work it for good. It's a truth for us all. But in this case alone, this, the prayers were answered. And so when a prayer is answered, you give thanks, right? 1 Thessalonians 5.18, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We're to give thanks for an answered prayer. God healed Epaphroditus. He had mercy on him and also on Paul. Look at this in verse 27. For indeed, Epaphroditus was sick unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon Sorrow. Paul gives thanks and rejoices in the Lord. He rejoices and he gives thanks to the Lord. The Lord thought of him. He, it probably would have tore Paul up even more. He's sitting in prison. He finally has an individual that's ministering to him. And he's also getting the gospel, the grace of God out. And all of a sudden he gets the healing, the Epaphrodites. Man, that probably just cheered Paul up, didn't it? God had mercy on him, not in him only, but on Paul as well. Paul says, he says, give thanks. And then he says, rejoice. Read verse 28 with me. And I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be le the less sorrowful. Again, what you have here is the, after Epaphroditus, God, he got healed up. God healed him up. He had mercy on him. He's, he's now no, no longer sick. Apostle Paul sends Epaphroditus where? 
back home. But he just doesn't send them back home with nothing. He sends them back home, I believe, with this epistle. With this epistle. He sends them back home. And he tells them they get, he, they get this epistle from, I believe, Epaphroditus. And Paul says, give thanks and say rejoice. Paul rejoices that his brother in Christ was back on his feet. And he also rejoices that he can send him back to the Philippi, the, to the saints there, with this letter written to them. And see, this letter, if you read this letter, and you continue reading this letter, it had important things for this church. He was thrilled. He was thrilled that their messenger, whom they sent to him, he now can send back to them. And he can be a blessing to them. See, Paul wants to be a blessing to them. Isn't that how it's weird? You want to be a blessing? I want to be a blessing to you, but you want to be a blessing to me. It's how it's, we're to be other what? Centered. That's the mind of Christ, being other centered. The, they, the, they wanted to encourage, he wanted to encourage them who encouraged him. It's a lesson for us all. And the question is, how can we encourage someone today? What gifts has God given to you to bless others with? Think about that. Think about that. Think about it over lunchtime, by the way. What gifts has God given you and how can you be a blessing to others? He tells them to rejoice in being reunited. Receive him, therefore, in verse 29, therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Receive him in the Lord with all gladness. Be thrilled and excited that he is with you. He almost wasn't. And as a church family, let us consider this for a second. Ready? We reunite after a busy, busy week, right? We go to work at, you know, we all go to our different jobs, right? During the week, right? Okay. And then we come back on Sunday morning or maybe Wednesday night, right? We reunite after a busy week or busy half week. We should be excited to see each other and to rejoice together. That's the idea you can get out of it. It's a little bit of application out of that verse. And then Paul also says in verse 30, Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Paul tells them not to forget Epaphroditus' service for the Lord. Don't forget he was close to death. He was, and, and, and don't, do not forget, he was more concerned that he was more concerned about their hearts instead of his heart stopping. Hold him up as a dear brother in Christ. Mark him, what he's trying to say is mark him as an example, a role model. See, Paul continues on here in Philippians. We don't have time, but Philippians 3.17, he talks about role models, marking individuals that walk as Paul, that, that, are, that are godly men. He says, mark them, not to put a target on their back, not to beat them up, but mark them so you know how you're to be walking, that they're an example of the Lord. Again, you have Epaphroditus, who was a brother of Paul, a companion in labor, and a fellow soldier, and a messenger, he's an encourager. And God says, mark him. He's an example of how to be and how to be a great model. We all need to be good role models, do we not? We need good role models in the, role, in the world, do we not? Epaphroditus is a man who displays the mind of Christ. That's a good role model. A guy you want to look up to. He's a faithful friend. He's a companion in labor, a fellow soldier, He's an answer to prayer. We aren't told everything he did for the Lord, Jesus Christ. We aren't told everything he did with the Apostle Paul. But one day in eternity, we will see the impact of his ministry. See, Philippians, yeah, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 18, it talks about what? Our resurrection, where Lord Jesus Christ comes back in the air. We meet him in the air and forever we'll be with him in the air. But who are we going to be with? All of our brothers and sisters in Christ. All members of the body of Christ will gather together. We will reunite. One day the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have a family reunion for the whole body. The question is, are you going? Do you know how to get there? And how you get there is this. You believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried and he rose again. Believe in that, you shall have eternal life. Amen? Are you looking forward to that day? I sure am. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Epaphroditus. We thank you for the Apostle Paul sharing it. 
We thank you that we can learn from it and grow from it. Help us to be prayer warriors, Father. Help us to pray for each other continuously. And Father, help us to be encouraging to each other as well. Help us to be soldiers getting the gospel out to the, to the unreached. In Jesus' name, amen.